All right, so I have just opened the room up and we can see people coming in. Hello, hello, welcome to our Super Science Teen Virtual Science Cafe. Um, we're gonna give it a minute to let everybody come on in. Um, we have about half as many in that I'm expecting, so we'll just give it a moment. Share my screen. Okay, so welcome everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Lauren Traster. I'm the 4-H Teen and Leadership Program Coordinator with UVM Extension and I coordinate um, our teen science cafes. So for those of you who've been with us before, you know the drill. We love to have you introduce yourself in the chat box. So find where your chat box is and put in your name and where you're from. Awesome, I see Eva's joining us again from Moncton and Miles back from Amherst. Corey's here from Burlington and Sophia's joining us from Manchester, Vermont. Jasmine's here from New York, that's fantastic. Oh, we have Kelsey from Chicago. I was just telling our presenter that we usually do get some people outside of Vermont. I see Lily's back with us again from Vermont. John's here from Burlington, this is great. Thank you all for coming in today. So in a few minutes, we'll get started. I'm going to pop into the chat box the information if anyone does need our live captioning services today just click on the link and that will take you to the live caption hi francis from colorado and shanka from essex oh we have a family from colorado that's fantastic so moving along i just want to go over what our protocols are from when we hang out here in zoom land so all of you are muted today. You don't have the ability to speak, but we do have lots of ways that you're gonna be able to engage with our presenter. We use the chat box for sharing your thoughts and answering questions the presenter might have, but we stay on topic. The chat box is not for personal conversation. It really is for discussion around today's topic. We also have a Q&A box. We use the Q&A box specifically for questions that you have for our presenter. So that's where you're gonna put those questions. The cool thing about the Q&A box, there is a thumbs up option, which is if you click on it, you might go in there and see a question that you were gonna ask, or maybe there's a question that you like that someone else asked. If you give it the thumbs up, it actually upvotes that question, moves it up the ranks. But it doesn't matter because we make sure to answer all your questions before we leave today. We think it's really important that you ask questions and we think it's equally important that your questions get answered. So we'll make sure that that happens. So while we are here in Zoom land, we ask that you are courteous and respectful to one another as well as to our presenter. Just make sure that there are no distractions and really the way we are today, myself and our presenter are the only ones that are on video. So the only real way to cause distraction is by using the chat box inappropriately. So again, chat box is just for conversation on today's topic. So we ask that you stay engaged and participate fully in what we're doing today. So as I move on, if anybody has just joined us, please make sure to go and introduce yourself into the chat box. We do love to just see and hear from everybody who's joined us today. So sharing, I wanna let you know, so we've been doing this Summer of Science series. Today is the second to last cafe we have for the summer. We only have one more. Next week's cafe on backyard chickens and learning about some of the uh, issues related to salmonella. But we are planning on doing more cafes this fall, but the big question is when? with schools having all different kinds of schedules. We are trying to figure out the best day of the week and time um, that most people would be able to come. So we've just issued a survey um, and I will be resending that out so you have the link. Please take the survey if you are interested in having these cafes continue. 
and help us figure out when we should offer them. So we thank you ahead of time um, for participating in that survey. So today's Science Cafe is on the importance of pollinators. And our presenter today is Jessica Cole. Jessica is a graduate student in the biology department at the University of Vermont. Her current research focuses on the indirect efforts pesticide exposure from non-agricultural areas and flowers have on wild bees. Her research studies the risk non-agricultural habitats and flowers have on bees and ways to de decrease that risk and benefit pollinators. So before joining UVM, she did her undergraduate degree at the University of Mississippi, where she received her bachelor's in biology. So at this time, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Jessica for joining us today. And we're excited to learn about your work. Yes. Um, hi, thank you, Lauren. Uh, she pretty much touched on everything right there for my good intro. So not to keep anyone waiting, I'm going to go ahead and launch into my presentation. And thank you again for coming today. This is something I really enjoy talking about. I love my research and I love sharing it basically with anyone who will listen. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to start my presentation. As Lauren said, if at any point anyone has questions, they want to ask me, feel free to pop it in the box and she will ask me and I'll find a good stopping point and try and answer all your questions. So um, as I mentioned, as she said, the title of my presentation is The Importance of Pollinators. Today, I'm hoping to expose you to not only the different types of pollinators that there are worldwide and globally, but also why they're important, what's happening with them recently, and what we can do and what I'm doing specifically with my research to sort of help them. So uh, why don't we begin? So the outline today is I want to start you off on my journey. So how I got to where I am today and then talk to you just generally about pollinators, the different types, the different species there are. Finally, what's um, negatively affecting them. So harmful factors that are there that they are exposed to and what's happening because of these. And finally, wrap this all up with a summary and questions. So as she mentioned, I am originally from Meridian, Mississippi, about 1,200 miles away from here. Um, I started my undergrad career, always, I've always been interested in science, but I wasn't really aware of pollinators or their issues. So I think around maybe sophomore year, I just happened to see a trailer for a documentary about bees called The Vanishing of the Bees. It's a really good uh, documentary if you have time to watch it. And in this trailer, it just essentially opened me up to the world of pollinators of bees and how they're basically struggling and they have been struggling for the past decade. So after I saw that trailer, I got really interested in pollinators. And so I did a little more research. I read a lot more things. I visited some bee farms. This picture of me in the left is I'm holding a honeybee frame from a hive, which you can see in the background. But essentially it's being swarmed with uh, honeybees, none of them were attacked me. I never got stung by them. And this was the moment I really realized that this is something that I want to do for the rest of my life. I love bees and I want to help them. So I realized that I wanted to help them and I was questioning myself, like, what's the best way to do that? And so I said, I wanted to go to graduate school. I wanted to get my degree and then become a teacher one day. So during my uh, sort of exploration of where I wanted to go for graduate school, I came across this wonderful lady in the top left corner. Her name is Dr. Allison Brody. She is a professor at the University of Vermont. She specializes in plant-animal interactions. So, you know, how do insects or pollinators or bees, how do they interact with the plants around them? And so I did some research into her and her work, and I was like, this is who I want to work under. This is who I want to advise me as I work in my career. So I reached out to her, we had conversations. I applied to UVM and I got in and I moved here August 1st, 2018. And I haven't looked back. I really enjoyed being here, being out and exposed to so many different types of diversity and flowers and insects. And it's just completely different from Mississippi and I've loved it ever since. So 
that's about me. And now let's get into the actual content. So just a general open question. What, if I were to ask you, what is a pollinator? What would be a very general definition that someone would say that a pollinator is? You guys can type into the chat box. This is, this is where we use the chat box. So let Jessica know what you think a pollinator is. And if you don't, if you don't also, if you don't want to be very specific, you can think of what does a pollinator do? So we have, Eva says, a creature that spreads pollen from one plant to another. And Sophia says, an insect or animal that spreads pollen through its natural movements. Okay, those are very, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm really happy. Those are perfect answers, yes. So, and that's actually what I have. So I made it more generalized where I said something that carries and or deposits pollen onto a plant to allow fertilization. So it's some sort of animal or insect that will visit a flower, pick up pollen or deposit pollen from some other flower, and that will allow fertilization of the plant. So those are very good answers. I'm happy about that. So now that we know generally what a pollinator is, let's think more about what they do. And I think this is a good time for our first poll question. Great, so in a minute, I'm gonna launch the poll, but the question is, why do pollinators visit flowers? Is it A, so is it A, pollen, B, nectar, C, just pollen and nectar, D, scents, fragrance, E, wet, wax and oils, or F, all of the above? So I've launched the poll. You can put your answer in, and if for some reason you don't see the poll, you can always put the letter, of the answer you choose in the chat box. We'll wait for a couple more answers to come in, but it looks like all of the above has taken a huge lead. <laughs> okay. All right, so we'll stop the poll there and it looks like 75% of you think the answer is F. How did they do? Uh, they, the people who answered F, uh, well, I can just show you. So F is the correct answer. So it depends on the pollinator, but all of these things, including scents, fragrances, waxes, and oils, all of these things pollinators collect for their own home or for their own children. So yes, it's true. So in a sense, everyone is right, where yes, they do it for nectar. They also go for pollen and nectar, but the, the most correct answer is F all of the above. So good job to those that said F, um, and still good job to everyone else. So, and so here's just a nice visualization of that, of just some of those answers. So what do they do? So on the left, we have this bee, and as you can see, she is collecting pollen. And as you can see, there's a lot of pollen right on her back legs, so bees, this specifically is a pollen forager. So when bees visit flowers, they often are covered in pollen. So they have specialized hairs on their legs that they use to brush all the pollen and pack it onto their legs so that they can then take it home. So that is a pollen forager on the left. And on the right, this is a bee. We can actually see her drinking some nectar with her proboscis, that's her tongue. And so this bee is specifically a nectar forager. So this nectar is like, think of it as a really sugary drink that gives them lots of energy and it's like their main food source. So it'll give them energy to do whatever they need to do. So they'll drink it for themselves. They'll drink it and take it back to their home and share it with their other sisters. Hey Jessica, we have a great question. Um, yes. How do you tell a bee's gender? Because you refer to the bees as her. Yes, that's a very good question. So majority of bees that you see are inherently female. They will always be female until about fall. So during fall is when the queen will start producing males because traditionally a lot of bees die right before winter. So they produce a lot of males. These males mate with other females, but then the males die as well. So as soon as they mate, they die and only females are left behind. And females are the main workers, so females are the only ones that are produced 
throughout the year. And around fall, males will be produced, they will mate and they will die. And the females will sort of will, uh, overwinter or hibernate until the following spring. So that's why whenever you see a bee outside, you can say basically with almost 100% certainty, that's a female until about fall, which then you may say that could be female or male. Was that, did that answer your question? Okay, so I hope that was good. Um, so then, as I mentioned, um, bees don't just visit flowers for nectar and pollen. So I found this of me, I love this video, I found it on YouTube showing a different type of bee visiting a flower for different uh, reasons. I'm not gonna spoil it, but you'll see it when I watch, when we play the video. And so I'm gonna play it now. If you can't hear it, please put it in the um, chat box so that I can either try and figure out that a way everyone can hear it, or I can put the link in the box and you all can watch it at a later time. I really enjoyed that. I love that video, but that's a, like a live um, visualization that those specific bees are traveling to orchids and they actually rub the scent off the orchid and they use it as a perfume to attract females. So in that case, they were going to the plant just for scents, oils, or fragrances. And, okay. So we've talked about what generally, poll what are pollinators generally and why they visit plants. So let's talk about what, what do you think of when you think of a pollinator? So if I were to ask you, give me some classic examples of pollinators. Can anyone uh, provide examples of what a pollinator would be? So think of species or animals. So, Lily says bees. Bees, of course. Emma says mud dauber. Mud daubers, it's a type of wasp. And Corey says hummingbirds, and Lily says butterflies. Nicole says hummingbirds, bees, and butterflies. I'm gonna say bats. Okay. So those are all perfect examples of your classic pollinators. Whenever we think pollinators, we often think birds, especially hummingbirds. We think of butterflies, and we think of the various types of bees. And so, and it's true that these are all pollinators. However, there are even more than we imagined. So there's more than you think. So I think Lauren, you said bats. So bats are also included, but there's flies are also considered as pollinators. Their bodies are covered in hair. And while they don't intentionally pollinate, whenever they do visit flowers, they visit for nectar. Pollen gets caught on their hair and they visit other flowers and you also have uh, uh, fertilization. Bats are very important pollinators in desert climates and also tropical climates. Uh, there's actually small rodents when you think of like prairie mice and small uh, wild mice. They are also considered as pollinators. They typically pollinate very low hanging flowers. There's also beetles, which most people never guess, but beetles are also considered pollinators. It's very specific. Um, beetles though. So think of hairy beetles, which we don't see often, but an organism that has hair and visits flowers will most likely be a pollinator because pollen gets trapped on those hairs and then they can go to another flower and the pollen will come off. But also moths are pollinators and moths are very important pollinators, not just for day plants, daytime plants, but also nighttime flowers. So there's certain flowers that only flower at night and moths, as we know, are very active during the nighttime. And so these are the main pollinators of those nighttime flowers. And finally, someone said it, wasps, uh, such as mud daubers, they are very important pollinators as well. So there's more pollinators out there than we think. So Jessica, there is a question asking if frogs can be pollinators. The questioner said, I found one in a flower. Was it just there for the crab spiders? <laughs> And, and, um, and a side note, they love this. Um, and why you answered, there was another question of what do bees do with the pollen? And you had mentioned fertilization, but maybe if you can just expand on that briefly, just so, so people 
can know what the point is. Right, so bees specifically collect pollen and they take it back to their hive and they feed it to their babies or their brood as it's called. So the very young bees only eat pollen, very little nectar. So the adult bees actually don't eat pollen. They collect it and they take it back to the hive because if those babies don't get pollen, they don't become bees. And I think, what was the other question? The oh. fro if frogs can be. If frogs can be, um, I don't want to say yes or no, because, you know, each year we're realizing that there's more different, there's just way more pollinators than we imagine. It could be that maybe that frog is a pollinator. I haven't heard of it, but that doesn't mean it's not true. Okay. That was a very good question. I have a friend who does work with frogs. And so if I ever have the chance, I'm going to ask just because I'm interested in that now. So uh, the next thing is we mentioned, so not all pollinators like the same things. So you can walk outside and you, depending on where you live, you may see that there's numerous types of flowers out there. And pollinators, while they all do uh, gravitate to flowers, they don't all like the same types of flowers. So for example, um, these two are bats. They're the, the on the left is the Mexican long tongue bat and on the right is the lesser long nose bat. Yes, that is its official common name. And these are these bats are ones that reside in desert climates and they mainly feed on the fruit and the flowers of cactus plants. So without uh, without these bats, cacti actually would not be able to reproduce and produce more cacti because they need these bats to pollinate their flowers. The same goes for rodent pollinators, where this on the left is the hairy-footed gerbil. We can see its snout is directly in this plant. And as you can see, on its snout, it has pollen. So this gerbil is gonna visit one flower and then it's gonna go to another one and it has that pollen on its snout. And that's how this rodent acts as a pollinator. And of course, bees. So I, bees specifically, I, although I do research on pollinators in general, I specialize in bees because I just love them so much. And there's quite a number of bees out there. So now we're gonna get a little bit more focused into bees because that's what I do research on. So here's another time for a poll. Um, and Lauren, I'll give it, hand it over to you. So I don't, Okay, so it looks like our poll has officially ended. And the question was, how many species of bees are there? And it looks like the leading answer is C, 25,000. And if you chose C, you're very much correct. <laughs> I'm really happy with the knowledge of bees that are out there. But yes, there are a variety of bees and we estimate that there are around 25,000 that we know of. Each year, more areas of the world are being explored and more species are discovered. But as of right now, we do think that there are around 25,000 species of bees. So, and this is just another, this is just to show you the, a brief glimpse of the different types of bees. But yes, there are 25,000 species. Jessica, can you go back one slide? I believe this question is asking, what are the names of the green bees? So I'm assuming it's the green bee that was on your poll question, because oh. they've seen them around, just wondering what the name is. Yes, so this specific bee is known as just a common name. This is called a sweat bee. They're very tiny. They tend to go for um, like small purplish flowers that have tubular entrances. The literal name is Agochlora, 
Um, and <laughs> I don't know if you want to say that, but it's just easier to call it a sweat bee. And sweat bees, well, I'm not going to give, give it away too much just because we're about to get into that, but this would be called a sweat bee. And yes, the name is as it sounds, they will drink sweat of humans if given the opportunity. So moving in further into bees, there are four types. So we're all pretty, fil pretty familiar with honeybees and of course the beautiful buzzing bumblebees, but also there are uh, a, there's a huge category of bees known as solitary bees. And then there's another huge category of bees known as sweat bees. So if you see a bee, it's traditionally going to fit into these four categories. And this just determines generally what the bee uh, will do. So the first one I wanted to talk about are solitary bees. So as of right now, we think that there are around or a little bit more than 200 species. And it's important to know that most of these are non-aggressive. They tend to nest in underground burrows. If there was like a mouse nest that has been abandoned or some other insect that abandoned their nest, these bees will often take over it. Or they also have the capability of building their own underground nests. They are very good diggers and they make um, like tunnels, think of tunnels sort of like moles where they have very often they have multiple shoots going off one main tunnel. So the females are the main heroes of these bees. The females construct these nests and they traditionally lay between one and 20 eggs each year. And after they lay their eggs and they uh, gather enough food for their young, they die, unfortunately. They only live about a year before they lay eggs and they die, and then the next generation does the same thing. So they lay these eggs and they traditionally emerge early in the spring and they start the cycle all over again. But what's interesting is that solitary bees are considered to be more efficient pollinators than honeybees. So when people think pollinators, they often think of honeybees as like the main pollinators. However, um, scientists think that one red mason bee can do the work of 120 worker honeybees, which is really interesting because most pollination people think honeybees, but we have these tiny, tiny little bees that are working harder than a whole hive. Well, well yeah, almost a whole hive given how many there are. But I just think that's really interesting. So, this, I wanted to give you sort of an image and a snapshot of what their hives look like. So the one up top, this is called the very fuzzy one. This is called a teddy bear bee, as you can imagine, because it's nice and cute and fuzzy. You might think of a teddy bear when you look at it, maybe not. And the bottom left, this is a leaf cutter bee. These bees will lay their eggs in these tubes and then they gather a bunch of pollen and they create what's known as pollen balls which is if you look in this picture with the purplish stuff. So what's happened is the bee lays an egg and then it gathers a bunch of pollen that the baby will hatch and eat so that it can grow. And then when it's finished laying all its eggs and then gathering all the pollen that, it, that the children need, the bee will cap the entrance so that nothing can get in. But when the children are full grown, they can chew their way out and they cap them with uh, bits of leaves that they have chewed, and that's where they got their name of leaf cutter bees. And this snapshot right here is you can actually put out ton if you want to catch uh, solitary bees. All you have to do is like put out hollow tunnels. Some people put out straws because they are very efficient at finding little holes, and then they will take over it and build their own nest in there. And they, people, when they put a bunch of them in one place, they call them bee hotels, because bees will visit and leave their children and come back. And it's just a really cute way and also a way to help them. So next I mentioned there are what's known as sweat bees. So of sweat bees, there's thought to be more than 1000 species that we have named. These bees are really interesting because they can be solitary. They can also be communal where everybody has their own home, but they live a little bit closer to each other. Semi-social is when more than one may occupy a tunnel or a, a 
borough. And then youth social is when a bunch of them will occupy one living space. And you can typically identify a sweat bee because they are known for their metallic color. So down here is the blue mason bee. And up here is the, is the uh, agochlora, as I told you. But not all of them are metallic, as we can see right here with this orange bee. But it's also these sweat bees, they pollinate any flower and crops. So they are not picky. Basically, they, they prefer flowers that have tubular entrances, but they will pollinate anything from a sunflower to a water lily. Um, and also, they also live underground or in burrow holes. So another interesting fact about the sweat bees is that they are often very small. When I say very small, think the size of millimeters uh, and not what we might typically think of a big bumblebee or a honeybee. So they are very, very small. And as I mentioned, they do drink human sweat. So they're attracted to the salt that's in our sweat. Um, they won't, if, if you don't bother them, they won't sting you. They rarely sting even when you hold them and press them a little bit. They won't die if they sting you, but they just don't, they're not aggressive like that. And also quite a few species of the sweat bees are known as social parasites. So they will go into another bee's tunnel or burrow. They will sometimes kill their, those eggs, lay their own eggs. And essentially the bee that actually lives there will collect pollen and feed the other bees children instead of its own. Or there's the other case where they just lay their eggs close to the other one and when the parasite's eggs hatch first, they will kill the other bee and eat their food. So they do have some social parasites in there and no one knows why, but that's just traditionally what they do. And finally, I don't know if anyone uh, saw this story in the news, but earlier in this year, there was a news story where there, this woman was gardening and she accidentally got four sweat bees in her eye. And they found that these tiny bees were actually living in her eye and feeding off her tears. Not to scare anyone, they don't traditionally just go in there and do that, but they are attracted to the sweat that's in our, they are attracted to the salt that's in our sweat. And so given the opportunity, these bees saw an opportunity to get an unlimited source of, um, well, salty water, and they took that chance. And this is just a snapshot. This, they had to really, they had to look at this under a microscope because these bees were tiny, tiny. So this is zoomed up a lot, but these are just three of the bees that they found living in there. They found a total of four bees living underneath her eyelid. So finally, everyone, I assume everyone has seen a bumblebee. They are the most common ones you might see. They're like beautiful orange, yellow, maybe some black, maybe some white. Uh, they're my favorite bee, honestly, even though bumblebee is, there's a lot of species. So of bumblebees, there's around 255 species. They typically live close to the ground. They can live under wood, under dead leaves, compost piles. They can create their own burrows, but they also would take over an empty burrow if necessary. And bumblebees are very social, meaning they like to live together. They like to live with their sisters and their queen because it's easier to protect the hive and they are just very social creatures. So the colonies can range between 50 members and 500 members. And it just depends on the year and the species. And another interesting thing that people um, don't know is that bumblebees also do not die when they sting you. I personally have been stung about 36 times by bumblebees and you know they just keep coming after you if you anger them the wrong way. But up in the left, we have uh, just a snapshot of a bumblebee colony. It doesn't look how you would typically expect, but you see like these round nodules. Some of these contain the brood or the babies. Some of these are what's known as honey pots. So bumblebees do produce a little bit of honey, not as much as honeybees, but they produce enough to sustain the colony and the queen and feed the babies. And some of these are contain what's known as bee bread, which is just a mixture of pollen and a little bit of nectar 
and it's sort of like a nice carb carbohydrate cake that they use for energy. So on to honeybees, the final category of bees. So most people know about honeybees. Um, they know that, you know, they contain the workers, the queens, and sometimes the drones. The queens can lay up to 2,000 eggs a day and live up to five years. And versus this actually the work, yeah, the workers only live between five to six weeks, unfortunately. There's a very high turnover rate in honeybee colonies. Um, and the workers have a variety of jobs that are dependent on how old they are. So depending on the age, they can build the honeycomb, meaning they never really leave the hive, or they can become foragers, the main ones that are out there collecting pollen, collecting nectar. They may act as nurses and nurture the brood, or they can act as guards where they just stand at the entrance and they defend the hive from any animal or person that may come and try and attack them or take their honey. But interestingly enough, our bees that are very common in the United States, they're not, they do not originate from the United States. Our bees come from Europe. Unfortunately, there are no typical American honeybees, but they came over here and they really thrive. And so you have wild honeybees and then you have managed honeybees. And I think after that brief introduction, I think it's a good time for another poll. Yes. Yeah. Before I launch that, there are two questions related to the slides you just did. Okay. Could we do those before the poll? Yes. Okay. So one person wants to know what's the biggest type. So out of the four, I'm guessing, what's the biggest? And then how long do bumblebees live? So bumblebees, unfortunately, are part of the bees that die in fall. So the queens emerge in the early spring, they start a new hive, and then in fall, they produce males, these males mate, and then the rest of the hive dies. So I'd probably, I'd say a couple of months. The queen will live a couple of months, like two to three months. The workers will live, again, um, five to six weeks which is why the queen constantly lays eggs. Um, so unfortunately, they are my favorite species, but they do die at the fall, at the beginning of fall. It's just their cycle. And the other one, the biggest, what was, what was the question? What's the biggest? What's the biggest um, of the four types? Yes, so the biggest types would actually be the sweat bees. So I know it says there's more than 1,000 species, so when it comes to species, you have to think that there's the main species and then there's what's called subspecies, where they kind of look like this bee, but they're slightly different. So the sweat bees have more than 1,000 known species, but almost 10,000 unknown subspecies. So the sweat bees would be the largest category. Great. Okay. What's so that? now we can get to your poll. And I'm going to launch it. The question this time is, how many bees are in a honeybee hive? Is it zero to 10,000, 10,000 to 60,000, 200,000 to 600,000, or 1 million? Oh, hang on. I'm going to relaunch. OK, now here's the poll. Sorry, there was a little glitch in my bandwidth. <laughs> it's like a horse race. It's like neck and neck. Which one's going to win? Nobody's thinking it's a million. <laughs> oh, someone wrote it for a million just because I said that, right? <laughs> <laughs> It looks like we have almost everyone in and 10 to 60,000 is in the lead. So we'll just stop there and see if that is correct. Once again, the majority is right. Depending on the hive, it's, it's So that's one hive and as you imagine, most people keep multiple hives, they don't just have one. Oh. And so 
A person can have millions in their backyard, but the typical honeybee hive has between 10 and 60,000 bees. And so good job to those. So finally, I just wanted to briefly go into like the structure of a honeybee hive. So within a honeybee hive, there's levels, think of them as levels, and the bees are very, very organized. So they have certain areas where they only have honeycomb, and this is just all these images show honeycomb. So this is when, so nectar, when a bee collects nectar, they will go back to the hive and they will chew on it and they will um, sort of like swap it with their sister and she'll chew on it. And then they will do that for a couple of times because when they chew on it, it makes it a really thick consistency. So that's when it turns into honey after they've chewed on it and then swapped it a couple of times, added in a few enzymes and nutrients that they have from their body. And then they put it in these cells and they cap it. So over the top, this is beeswax. They put the honey in there and they cap the cell with beeswax and they store it up for the winter. So honeybees are the only types of species that are annual, well not annual, but they live throughout the entire year. And they do this by foraging during the summer making all this honey, collecting all the pollen, storing it so that they can eat it during the winter. And so this is what you see right here. This is just a really close up view of what a honeybee frame would look like. Then there's also what's known as worker combs. So they have other areas where they only grow more females. So in the bottom left, you can actually see the eggs that have turned into small grub-like larvae. And once they get old enough, the larvae will actually cap its own cell. cell. And this is when metamorphosis happens. And they change from a grub to actually looking like a bee. And these, um, they kind of look like honeybee cells, but as you can see, they're a little bit more sporadic. They don't fill the entire frame. There's gaps in the middle. And then the actual cap is a little bit more raised. And that's how you can tell that it's a worker in there that will be born eventually. Finally, they also have queen cells and drone cells. So it's very, typically a honeybee hive will only have one queen. However, if she gets old or she can't really control the hive anymore, they may decide to replace her. And so if you look in a hive and you see these really elongated, very large cells, this is a queen that they are rearing that will eventually hatch and take over the hive. Versus on the left, as I mentioned, they do produce males towards the fall. These males will mate and then die. These males have their, um, their hive structure sort of looks like a worker's, but they are much larger. They're not as large as the queen cells, but they're larger than the worker cells. And so that's how you know that these over here are males. And Jessica, a question from Jasmine. How do bees choose the queen bee? Huh. So in management, typically um, a person will just give a queen, but actually what they do is the bees will rear up five to six. They'll feed them a special substance called royal jelly that will turn the larvae into a queen. And the first queen to hatch is traditionally the queen. However, the first queen to hatch has to go and kill all the other queens before they hatch. Or if some hatch at the same time, they will battle it out and the winning queen controls the hive. So the workers just decide to make queens, but it's up to the queen to actually come out and fight and take her place. This is better than any daytime soap opera. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, there were bees making, <laughs> there were bees harmed in the making of queens. Um, yeah, so that's that. So moving on, so why do, so bees are very important, they're very diverse, so are pollinators. But if we think very closely, why are bees important as pollinators? So specifically, what do they do that makes them important? So this is a great time to sort of pop your thoughts into the chat why you think bees have that very important role as pollinators. Uh, Eva says they collect the most pollen. That's very true. 
bees are considered the most efficient and the best pollinators. But specifically, how do they, how, why are they important to us? Like they collect pollen and what do they do for humans? So they could be typing, there's always a delay. So we'll just give it a minute. Hopefully you guys are getting your, oh, here we go. So Bowie says they make honey. Lily says they help plants to grow and keep the world green. Eva right. says they make honey for humans, and Jasmine also says honey. Right. Seems like we have a lot of honey lovers. <laughs> um, yes. So, oh, hang on. Sophia says they fertilize crops, and Lily yeah. says the world would all would be all dead and brown without them. Yes. So perfect answers, all what I was expecting. So yes, bees make products that we like. So honey, and then anything else that involves beeswax, so that can be candles, lip balm, hair stuff. So bees make a lot of products that we use. Bees also uh, fertilize crops. So um, if you didn't know, a lot of crops, they have to flower first, bees visit them. And then because of that, we have a very diverse set of food. Um, I think someone else said, what was it? Without them, the earth would be very dead and green. A lot of flowers still rely on bees to visit them so that they can produce children and we have more flowers in the generation. So it is thought that if we didn't have pollinators, we would be living in a just dry desert sand wasteland without any green. And of course, that's no fun. And so someone mentioned it, as I said, the most important thing, fruits, vegetables, things that we love to eat that we probably should eat. Without bees, we wouldn't have a very large variety of delicious foods that we eat now, which makes this a very good time for a poll question. Okay, so our next poll question, how many bits or bites of food are because of pollinators? Is it one out of three, five out of eight, seven out of eight, or one out of four? And she is right. It should be how many bites of food. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I forgot to launch it. <laughs> so what do you think? One out of every three bites of food are because of pollinators, five out of every eight, seven out of every eight, or one out of every four bites of food are because of pollinators. Okay, it looks like so, seven out of eights is leading. Yeah, I think uh, right now the majority is saying seven out of eight. Are they right? Unfortunately, they are not. <laughs> no, this is the first time. This is the first time you all, um, unfortunately, are not right. So it's actually one out of every three bites because as we all know, it's easier to simplify fractions. And in the case of the simplification of this fraction, it's believed that one out of every three bites of food that we take are because of pollinators. Okay, so that means if we didn't have bees, you'd only be getting two thirds of your food. And if you think about it, it's only one out of three because pollinators really only uh, pollinate fruits and vegetables. But, you know, there's a lot of grain in our diets such as cereal, oats, wheat, pasta, things that don't rely on pollinators. So a lot of grains and like really big and really big um, cereals and things like that, those are wind pollinated because they're a type of grass. And the grass just needs wind to blow the pollen around, which is why generally around allergy season, that's why everyone's allergies are messing up because the pollen of all the grasses and the trees is picked up by the wind and carried away. So they actually don't need pollinators, but fruits and vegetables do. So other than that, as I said, bees are important. For one, pollination. So there are some farms where they will hire people to bring bees to their farm and pollinate their flowers. 
So in this case where you see this little box, this box is actually a bumblebee hive. In there is a whole hive of bumblebees with the queen and all her workers. And they'll take this box and they'll put it out in the field and they'll open it up so that the bees can fly out, pollinate flowers, get whatever they want as well, and then come back and live in that box. You can actually buy these offline. Um, some people do it just to put them out in their yard as well. And they're really nice in that sense that they can, you can basically buy pollination services. And also bees rake in a lot of money. So people think that around 200, between 235 and $577 billion each year are contributed by bees. So this includes a variety of products that they produce. This also, um, this also includes like pollination services. So actually moving them, having them pollinate certain fruit that people then sell. So it's not just, you know, their honey or everything, but that is also included. And that's a lot of money. And finally, um, bees are thought of as the canary and the coal mine. I don't know if anyone's heard that saying, but basically, um, a canary in a coal mine, back in mining times, people would send a canary into a coal mine and they would listen for the song or the sound of the bird. And if they heard the sound of the bird, that means that there was oxygen in the coal mine and they could actually travel in and be safe. However, if they sent the bird in there and they didn't hear the bird anymore, that means that there either was no oxygen or it had collapsed and unfortunately killed the animal. And that meant that that mine was not safe. And bees are essentially our canary of the coal mine, except they let us know how our environment is doing. So if our environment is doing well, our, that means our bees are doing well. And so this brings me to the question of what's happening to the bees? This is another open-ended question where I'd like people to maybe get inspiration from the pictures and you know, just take a guess at what they think is happening with bees and pollinators right about now. You guys can type into the chat. I'm going to guess the, the bee in the bottom of the screen is being entered in some kind of like pollinating race since it's number, <laughs> since it's number nine. Okay, that's a guess. <laughs> It's like the Bee Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone have any thoughts other than my um, senseless thoughts? <laughs> Eva says pollinators are getting killed because of less flowers and pesticides in people. Lily says people are killing them because they think they are mean. Yes, both of those are very right. Anything else? Okay. Okay, well, both of them are right. So in this bottom, unfortunately, there's no such thing as the Bee Olympics right now. This is a bee that is being experimented on and they have marked her as number nine to know so that with, they can track her behavior, her death, the things she does. But if we look at the main picture where we see the person holding a handful of bees, all of those bees are dead. And unfortunately, that is what's happening right now in our environment. So pollinator numbers are decreasing worldwide. So that means everyone is experiencing a loss of pollinators. I often get news regarding pollinators and I feel like every day I open up my news and it's telling me that we've lost 105,000 honeybee hives. And it's important because it's not just happening to honeybees but it's also happening to our wild bees as well. And that unfortunately is not good. So it is believed that the things that are killing our bees are things that we as humans are doing. And this is just a nice pinwheel showing that the, all the negative things that are affecting bees. So for one, there's transportation. As I mentioned, people will pay people to bring their bees to their farm to pollinate their hives. So if you think of a honeybee hive in the back of a car, you can't exactly stop and let them go to the restroom or let them stretch their legs, meaning that they often have to travel very long periods of time just being cooped up in the box. 
And this is important because bees are very clean and they will not use the bathroom in their own hive. They will actually go and fly far away because if they use the bathroom in their own hive, they run the risk of making it dirty and then getting a disease. So if you're traveling from Florida to California and you don't have a bathroom break, that's not good. Also, there's been the introduction of parasites on bees, which um, think of them as like bees, where humans have ticks that give us Lyme disease and other diseases. Bees have mites and other parasites that will latch onto them and give them diseases. There's also, you know, a lack of nutrition where someone mentioned they're losing a lot of their habitat due to deforestation, agricultural practices where a lot of natural habitat is being cut down and turned into something else. And this natural habitat is where these bees live. It's where they eat, find their food, where they mate. And if they don't have that, what are they supposed to do? And finally, pesticides. These chemical things that we're using everywhere that we're not really sure exactly how they affect bees. So these are the main things that people think are stressors to honeybees. And as I mentioned, now I'm going to go a little bit deeper into each one. So as far as diseases and pests, the main ones when it comes to bacterial diseases, there's thing, there are nosema and chrysidia. These are bacterial like fungal diseases that cause the bees to dehydrate and eventually die. There's brood diseases. So if uh, this means that the disease only affects the children and there's quite a lot of them and essentially the brood gets these diseases and they don't live, they don't eventually hatch. There's deformed wing virus, which you can see right here at the bottom where on this case, you see there's a mite or a parasite on this bee that has given it the, what's known as deformed wing virus. So this bee never fully developed her wings, meaning she can't fly, she can't forage or do anything. There are other RNA viruses that actually attack the bee's DNA and can cause other mutations and things that can kill it. And a lot of these diseases are thought to have been transmitted by these little red mites that you see on the bees. This one has, it looks like two, maybe three. This one down here has one. So these mites are essentially like ticks to honeybees and other types of bees. They latch onto the bee, they drink its um, spinal and other fluids. And if the longer they stay on there, the more viruses they transmit to the bees. And someone says, the, uh, one of these mites on a honeybee is equivalent, is equivalent to if a human had a rabbit attached to us. So obviously this is very important. And what's even worse is these diseases can be transmitted from bee to bee. So if you didn't know, bees do trophallaxis when they want to feed their sisters. So essentially they exchange fluids between their mouths. So that's one way that they can transmit a disease. They also visit flowers. And if they visit a flower and they may use the bathroom on the flower, another bee may come and pick up the disease that way. And also a lot of bees are social. So they're constantly rubbing up against each other, climbing over each other and talking through pheromones and saliva and stuff. So the actual, the way they live is another way that diseases can be transmitted, which is why the diseases and pest is a very big issue and one reason we know that pollinators are actually dying. So also there's are, as I mentioned, management practices and habitat loss. So on the left, we see we have this beautiful prairie-like field. It's full of natural grasses and flowers. This is an ideal place for a bee to visit and live. However, because the human population is increasing, we have to increase the amount of land we use to create more food. I mean, humans have to eat as well. So they, what people will do is they will take this prairie, completely mow it over and turn it into, let's say, a cornfield. Well, corn is one of these wind-pollinated crops that bees don't get pollen from. So they've essentially lost a huge habitat right there. And also, as I mentioned, management practices. There is a yearly sort of flock of all honeybees. So each year, 
there's a huge almond production in California. And if you have a lot of hives, that you will get paid a lot of money to take your bees to the almond orchard in California. So in this case, this is probably a trucker from Florida who is packing up his bees on these semi trucks and moving and moving them all the way to Florida to pollinate the almond groves. So as I mentioned, they are on the these bees are on the road from Florida to California with no stops because you can't really do that with bees and that negatively affects them as well. And finally, pesticides. So just another general question, what is the what is a pesticide? And you can put your answer in the chat box, yeah. What do you guys think a pesticide is? Yeah, Sophia, a chemical that keeps bugs off your crops. Yes. Anything. Well, that's a very good, that's a very good definition. Anyone we else also have, have a chemical that kills unwanted bugs. Yes. And things, chemicals that you put on your plants and lawns, chemicals used to deter pests, and unfortunately, wanted ones too, meaning they kill good bugs too. Um, Nicole says a spray that keeps all bugs off plants. Right. So yes, everyone is right. So the main thing about pesticide is it's a chemical that kills pests. And it's important to know that there's more than one type of pest. And so there are more than one type of pesticides. So insecticides, as they sound, they kill insects. And these are a really big problem for bees because while they target pests like other beetles and stuff that we don't want eating our crops, they also target pollinators. So someone mentioned accidentally targeting others. This is a prime example where insecticides negatively affect bees. There's also herbicides, which these are sprayed a lot of times on our fields to make sure that weeds don't grow and essentially take over our crops. There's nematicides, which are nematodes, are small worms that live in the soil that can chew on the roots of our crops. And so nematicides kill these little microscopic worms. There's fungicides that kill fungus that can take over and kill, uh, and kill fungus. Um, there's rodenticides, which as it sounds, it kills rodents. So things like mice, which are a very much plague on cornfields and stuff. And so it's important to know that there's a bunch of different pesticides out there. And it's not just one thing that kills bugs or just kills weeds. There are a bunch of them that are used on our food. And so I have a question, another question. So when you look at this picture that I pointed the red arrow at, what's the first thing you notice? And it's pink, says Yeva. It's pink, yes. These, these are both piles of corn seeds and it's pink. So why do we think that it's pink? Why do you think it looks different than the yellow corn? Yes. Eva says pesticides. Yes. And so does everyone else who's chiming in. <laughs> pesticides, yes. So on the, on the picture on the right, we see a man spraying pesticides. And traditionally, that is how it was done in the past. But recently, people, someone invented what's called systemic pesticides. So essentially, you coat the seed and the pesticide, and then you grow the seed. And as the seed grows, it absorbs that pesticide and it incorporates it into all parts of the plant. So you don't have to spray it anymore, you just coat it with pesticide, and then as it grows, the pesticide is already built into the plant. And what's really important to think about this is, that means it's not just gonna be in the leaves, or it's not just gonna be in the stalk, it's gonna be in every part of that plant, meaning it's gonna be in the flower, the pollen, and the nectar. So a poll, just a quick question. We've talked about all the factors and now I want your opinion. And Lauren? 
Yes, so our next poll is, which factor is killing the bees? Pesticides, disease and pests, management practice and habitat loss, something else, or all of the above? And Jessica, I'm just gonna have you watch the time. Okay, what time is it? It's 2.08. Oh, okay. <laughs> So it looks like the majority are saying all of the above. Right, yes, and that is correct. That is, um, so it is believed that all of these are killing bees. So we're just gonna go a little faster. All of the, the above, congratulations to those. So, and what it's called is, they've coined this term called the perfect storm, meaning that there are several contributing factors. So all of these things are contributing to killing pollinators. However, while all of them are contributing, people believe that pesticides stand out as the major contributing factor. So while they all are possibly killing them, pesticides may be the most lethal way or the most deadly. And so just to some brief information about pesticides, as I mentioned, insecticides are what's sprayed on the crops to kill insects. So there's about 4 billion pounds of pesticides that are used worldwide. And this is the only, and this is, includes the total of only the top 30 pesticides. There's actually over 200 different types of pesticides that are applied to crops, depending on the crop. And of the top 40, of the top 30, that totals 4 billion pounds. That's a lot of pesticides going into the environment, into our food and such. And the reason that insecticides are bad for pollinators is because they negatively affect them. So it inhibits their, um, their ability to forage, it decreases their reproduction, and also it decreases their homing efficiency, meaning once they forage and they're exposed, they often can't find their way back home. And finally, they cause death, as we can see the person holding a handful of bees right there. So, and so this sort of leads into my research. So insecticides, as I mentioned, you can either spray them or apply them to the seeds. If you spray them, between one and 10% actually reach the plant that you're spraying. Versus if you coat the seeds, only between three and 20% of the pesticides reach the plants. So that means that there's a lot, there's almost between 90, 80 to 90% of pesticides that are not uh, hitting the actual target, meaning they're going somewhere else. And so this is what's known as pesticide drift. Essentially, when the pesticide moves to a place it shouldn't be. And in this case, because agricultural land is often surrounded by other types of land, this means that pesticides can end up in parks and natural areas, even in your own backyard, if you're close enough to a place that uses pesticides. And so just another quick poll, where do you think the excess amount of pesticides end up? Okay, poll just launched. Do you think it's soil, water, other plants, or all of the above? And already it's, it's everyone's in <laughs> agreement, all of the above. <laughs> yes, all of the above. So when those pesticides move, they can move to other soil, other water, and also other plants. So all of the above, good job. Which is really scary when you think about it. Your dog could be drinking water that has pesticides in it, or you could be playing in a river that has pesticides in it. And so this is where I come in. So my research asks um, two, mainly two questions. So one, are pesticides in other areas that we don't think about? So if you live near a farm, there you may be exposed to pesticide drift. So are our homes, our parks, our natural areas, are they areas that pesticides are exposed to? And this is important because if we think about it, oftentimes we see pollinators, we see bees in our backyards and, and things like that. So if, they, if we have pesticides in our yards and we see bees in our yards, that means that they could be getting exposed to uh, pesticides in our yards and in the other area. So that's the first question my research asked. And then also, my second question is, are the flowers in these areas exposing bees to even more pesticides? So as I mentioned, people take their hives to 
agri to agricultural places to have them pollinate. And then those bees travel. So bees can travel up to two kilometers. They fly up to two kilometers, which is over two miles to find other uh, flowers. So the flowers that we have in our yard, if they are exposed to pesticides, are, they, are these flowers exposing pollinators to even more pesticides? So as we know, as I mentioned, the pesticides can be in the soil, the flowers, and the water. And so this is important because if we have pesticide drift in the soil, that means the soil from your yard could have pesticides in it. If you plant flowers in that soil, we all know flowers absorb nutrients and water from the ground. So that means that they're also absorbing pesticides from the ground and they're putting it in their flowers and their nectar and their pollen. And that also means that a lot of the food we eat is absorbing these pesticides from the ground and it's getting incorporated into the food that we eat. So it's not just affecting pollinators, it's also affecting us. So what do we do? And this is what I do. So how can we test? How can we test it? How do I identify flowers and things? So for my research, this is what I've been doing this summer. The first thing I do is identify the flowers that are most common around the areas. So each week I go and I look and I do a census. So I go to an area and I count all the flowers that are in that area. And I count the different types of species of flowers that, I'm, that are in this area. So this right here, the orange one, this is milkweed. As we know, it's very important to pollinators, but it's also important to bees, like sweat bees and solitary bees also visit these. So each week I go and I identify the flowers and I identify how many are there. And then as far as my experimental design, what I'll be doing in the fall, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these flowers and grow them. And then I'm going to expose them to certain amounts of pesticides. And then I will analyze the pollen and the nectar to see how much of the pesticides did these flowers absorb and put in their pollen and nectar. Because that'll tell me not only how much pesticides are in the flowers, but how much pesticides are bees being exposed to just from these flowers alone. And so in, in summary, uh, just because we're running short on time, pollinators are especially important for many reasons. And there are a variety of pollinators and they each have their own duty. And other, and set, summary continued, bees are dying from a variety of reasons with pesticides being the big contributor to their deaths. And pesticides are harmful and they drift from these pesticides and drift from these pesticides end up in many places. And potentially flowers may be exposing pollinators to more pesticides. And so that's where my research comes and hopefully in a year or so I'll have that answer. And with that, I'm done. This is my contact info if you have questions that you don't have time to ask me now. Um, but yeah, thank you for watching my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it and learned a lot. That's great, Jessica. We do have a couple of questions in the Q&A. And before we get to those, I'm gonna just launch um, we always ask you guys to give us a little bit of feedback. Um, this helps us, um, it's just some information we have to report on. So go, I launched the poll. Go ahead and answer the two questions. And then we're gonna go into the Q&A box and answer the final questions. I know we're running long, so we're, we're not gonna have you put any additional questions in, but we'll answer the ones that are currently in there. But Jessica's email, um, and Jessica, if you want to pop your email into the chat, if a question comes up um, at a later time, then you can go ahead and just email Jessica. But just want all of you to answer. All right, I'm going to end that poll. Thank you all for doing that. And let's get to the couple of questions that have been in the Q&A box. So Nicole wants to know, um, you talked about a queen bee. Is there a king bee? Uh, unfortunately, there is no king bee. It's just the queen and she runs the whole thing. Great. And is there a safe alternative for pesticides? Um, yes, there are what, there are like a category that are called organic pesticides, but also there's um, other ways. So like, for example, lime keeps away certain pests. There's certain essential oils, certain plants that keep away certain pests. 
but there are there are safer alternatives than spraying chemicals on your food. And last, this is always a good one, what's your favorite pollinator? My favorite pollinator would have to be the bumblebee. It's called, so it's specifically called Bumbus impatiens. It stands for the Eastern bumblebee. They are just the friendliest bumblebees that you will see out in your yard. And although I've been stung by them by like 36 times, I still <laughs> love them. They're really efficient and they are very good. Well, great. Well, I want to thank you. There you get a lot of thank yous coming into the chat box right now. It sounds like our participants really love learning about the pollinators and the work that you do. We will definitely want you to come back after you have some results from your research to share with us. But thank you so much for giving us your time today and sharing your work with us. Um, for all you. of you who joined us today, uh, we hope to see you next week for our final Summer of Science. And everybody just enjoy the rest of your day.